Next up, we have our second panel of the day. Um, the, pa the panel's on uh, journalism with Django, which is obviously where Django came from. Uh, so please introduce our panelists, who I believe will then be introducing themselves. Hello, everybody, once again. Uh, because Django came out of a journalism environment for probably for that reason, uh, it's had some uptake in the journalism world. And we thought it'd be interesting to get the perspective of that one uh, type of Django user and, and how, uh, how they use it, uh, how they think it can be improved, and just any other thoughts they have. So we have a number of illustrious journalists uh, who use Django here, and they're all going to introduce themselves. First, Ben. Hi, uh, my name's Ben Welsh, and I'm, um, I work at the Los Angeles Times, where we do some uh, database projects for the web, and before that I worked in D.C. at the Center for Public Integrity, and kind of came into it through the investigative journalism world like, uh, like Matt here. And I guess that's my introduction. I'm Matt Waite. Uh, my title is News Technologist at the St. Petersburg Times, which is to say if anybody knows what the hell I do, I'd love to know. You can tell me later. Um, I've used Django for a little over a year now. Uh, I've launched two sites. Uh, my first project, still online, is a project called PolitiFact, which fat checks presidential ca uh, candidates. And what's the second? I'm sorry? What's the second project you've done? Oh, it was a, uh, we just launched it. It was a real estate, uh, a neighborhood-based real estate site where you can, if you live in the Tampa Bay area, you can get uh, a somewhat ridiculous amount of detail about how houses are selling and for how much in your very small micro neighborhood. Cool. And, and Ben, you didn't mention any projects that you'd worked on. So oh, could you just um, really quickly? We've only been doing Django at the LA Times for since I think about Memorial Day. And we've put out uh, three apps since then. The first was we ripped off one of yours. We did a, um, we did a, a Memorial Day thing about California servicemen and women who died in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we also did uh, dog registrations in Los Angeles. So you could see like the most common dogs or look up your name and see where they're at and what the most common breeds are, goofy stuff like that. And then this week we put out, um, on a very tight deadline, I'm proud to report, uh, the, the new school scores here in the state of California. Uh, so you could see um, how your local school is doing or compare them across the state. Cool. Uh, my name is Maura Chase and I work at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which if you don't know, that was actually where Adrian worked first, but that's another story. Um, I've worked there for about a year and I've been using Django for about two years. Um, we don't have, um, we have a kind of a separate CMS that's, we don't have Ellington or anything, so we build more kind of like site enhancements and special projects in Django. Um, probably our biggest thing is we do all the photo galleries on the site. They get lots of traffic. People love to look at photos. And I'm uh, Matt Croydon. I'm development manager at Media for Media, which is the shiny new name for World Online. Um, you know, obviously we're associated with the journal world, birthplace of uh, Django. Um, and I've been involved a lot with uh, both the development of Ellington, our content management system, and also a lot of uh, database journalism, uh, data visualization projects uh, for and with the newsroom. All right, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're putting this together, putting this panel together because Django came out of this journalism environment. I wanted to get your thoughts. Are you using Django because it came out of a journalism environment or would you have found it otherwise? Do we have like extra cred in that world in your opinion? Does it matter? How does it help us? How does it hurt us? What do you think? I, I don't think I should be answering this, so I'm going to pass it off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Matt doesn't really have a choice. Um, I think that I actually used Django before I worked at the paper. Um, so I came from Django from a non kind of paper um, background. Um, I think that it, I mean, kind of both. I mean, it definitely has extra credit, you know, because it came out of newspapers and, you know, everyone knows about Django and they know about the Lawrence Journal world. So, um, you know, there's obviously great reasons to use Django, bes you know, besides that fact, but I think that's, it's definitely a big deal. I agree. I think it's I think it's evolving. I think it is both. I think it started out as, hey, some other newspaper made this. Let's check it out. I, I joke that that the reason that that newspaper people use Django is slug fields, because it harkens back to hot type 
I mean, when people set type and put it, they were slugs that they use. So that's like, you know, comfort food to us. Oh, look, <laughs> slugs, wee. But I have seen, just to interrupt, I have seen an uptake in usage and awareness of the term slug, like since Django has been released, just like in random blogs. But it's like home cooking. So <laughs> yeah, can we swap in TK for null at some point or something? Um, that one's before my time. <laughs> oh, long story. But um, I, I would say that the answer to that is a resounding yes. And I mean, it may not necessarily always be for the best reasons. I mean, you know, how do ideas spread? How do memes happen? I mean, there's a degree to which that there's, um, this is kind of a bad phrase to use, but almost a cult of personality that kind of happens to a certain degree where within the journalism world, there's this knowledge among managers and among people who run the organizations that they need to change, but a lot of them don't really know how or what that change should look like or how it should take shape. And I think when there are people within the journalism community who um, are at least attempting to articulate some version of an alternative or the future, I think that it, it, it has more credibility than what comes from outside. So I think when Adrian or Rob Curley or whoever shows up on Romanesco saying, this is, this is one version of the future, or what I think a possibility for the future could be, I think that that carries a lot more credibility than, or it just has a greater chance of propagating itself. Another thing that I would mention, and we'll probably talk about this more in a little bit, but um, the admin, the auto admin, is just a, just a killer feature for a newsroom because of you know deadlines and it's there and you get people putting in data right away with for free. So that that's a or yeah, de ahead. deadlines in a matter of hours. I mean, yeah, the admin makes that. What I was going to say, uh, one thing you have to realize that going to Ben's point is that newspaper editors tend to be more fad conscious than a gang of tweens at a mall. So, you know, one person makes something work, they're going to chase it like a herd of kids. I mean, it's like, uh, I, saw, I saw an amazing slide in a presentation at another conference where it was a picture of, like, six-year-olds playing soccer, and they all bunch around the ball, and they just chase the ball around, like this little mass of kids just chasing the ball around the field. Journalism. Yeah. Pretty much right there. But, but I mean, it... I, <laughs> You know, and, and that, that's, that's, that's flip, and I, 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 in a sense, agree with it, but I mean, that also is an opportunity for everybody in this room to do something, because you have an audience of potential customers who will, you know, give you money to do things for them, right, and to come up with cool stuff, and, and, and also be able to put that on a platform where a lot of people will see it, which is, I mean, that's a lot of fun, right? And so there's opportunities for, I think, products made out of Django, or made from Django, or I don't know what, to be sold to the newspaper audience because there's competitor products that are being sold now that suck and you guys could kick them just you guys could could take over yeah like caspio oh. <laughs> if you if you want the name so matt what was the quickest turnaround ever for a, a journalism django project that you'd made uh 4 hours um it, when uh Hurricane Faye looked like it was going to come straight up our tailpipe. Uh, I noticed that what, I, what the newsroom was doing was taking all of this structured information and just dumping it in a blog. And they were doing it at such a volume that important information like which hurricane evacuation shelters were open was rocketing down the list. I mean, it's just a chronological order blog. Well, that, you know, these shelters are opening. That's a life or death thing. And in half an hour, an hour, it's six posts down the line, and it's gone and you can't find it anymore. So uh, that bothered me, so I sat down and just quick banged out an app in, in GeoDjango, actually, that mapped out where the hurricane evacuation shelters were, so you could see where they were and which one was the closest one to you, and the admin allowed the, the uh, clerks to just start punching in the data, and it turned out that Faye turned away from us and we never got to use it, so yeah, I built one in four hours that nobody ever saw. <laughs> the other matter. Um, I mean, for the longest time, we had the sort of running gag at work of, uh, you know, we'd talk about a, uh, an idea over lunch, and by the end of the day, it was launched. And, uh, I mean, that's pretty common for both, uh, you know, short turnaround stuff, staying up all night to get something done for the next day's paper, or the next day's news cycle, um, but also just, you know, trivial little things. Hey, this, this would be fantastic. Let's do it. Oh, it's done by the end of the day. Any particular examples? Sorry, I'm blanking. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, so have you guys generally found that the workflow is create your models, sick some reporters loose on the admin, and then they're putting in data while you're working on the views and the templates? Yeah, definitely. Um, it seems like uh, 
at the journal world, we're sort of shifting from, um, you know, here's my data, let's model it in, in Django apps uh, and, you know, unleash the, uh, the reporter in the, you know, in the admin. Um, these days we're doing a lot more, um, you know, looking at the, uh, the structured data ahead of time, uh, you know, get it in a, a Google Docs or, you know, so that we can get to it via CSV and then doing, you know, automated imports or, you know, providing tools for if it's just a real simple, you know, tabular or, you know, uh, you know, one thing over time, uh, you know, we have tools that uh, don't necessarily require as much programmer uh, intervention as it used to. Right, right. Ben, how's, how are things at the LA Times? Um, well, I think the, ad, the admin came in uh, uh, really handy when we did the, uh, the Memorial Day project uh, about uh, casualties in the war where it, we, we, we hadn't done any Django projects before, and it was sort of I had to sell people on letting us do this. And one of the one of the things that that made me comfortable that we could do it on a tight deadline and 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 in a couple of, and maybe three weeks when it required a lot of additional entry and and modification of the source data was that I knew that on day one once I had the models up I could have someone totally independent of me doing all that work while the the, the web development was happening, and that is I mean just a huge advantage. I mean I'm sure people here in other circumstances have are familiar with that advantage, but I mean, it's it's something that is just peculiarly suited to a newsroom, you know, when things just come up quickly and you have to do it, you know, if there was, there's a, a, umpteen examples of how you could work with it, but I agree. So journalists are probably some of the stupidest people technologically uh, <laughs> who, use, who use Django admins. Are they taping this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I'm wondering what your experience has been in in showing journalists and reporters the admin, sure. just in general. How how does it go? We'll go over with them. Uh, well, one, yeah, on that note, one of my favorite jokes is both Matt and I uh, come out of the in, the investigative journalism world where computers were adopted in like the late 70s and early 80s by some forward-thinking guys who just wanted to do more sophisticated analysis. So you want to do like some social science, like heavy duty, like let's get get at the data from the local courthouse or whatever, they learned how to do it. And both of us kind of came up trained in that world, which kind of naturally bridged into this. And the really awkward phrase for people that do that, which is, sounds very antiquated today, but is a computer-assisted reporting, which is, which is you know, car. And I, I always make the joke that it's still around today and it's still used very frequently in our world. And it's almost kind of embarrassing for us, some, at least for me it is, because I always think you never hear today of a computer-assisted photographer or a computer-assisted architect you know, it's, it's only in the field of journalism where you still manage to distinguish yourself by using Excel. But, <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but, but Django has made inroads just in the short period of time we've used it with people who ne aren't necessarily that savvy. I mean, um, it's easier to use as an admin than our CMS or um, for people who approve comments on our sites, they use it and they all seem to like it. And one of my things I'm most proud of, or is just so great, um, is one of the, the Metro editor who I worked with on the Worded thing had, um, is, is, is not someone who's, who is not very webby, but who's open to change and who wants to do things and who really has been, I think, rewarded by the process of this project. And she came up to me the other day and she said, um, you know, I'm really looking for something else for us to django -fy, you know? <laughs> and to me, that just felt like a huge victory. Yeah, I think uh, the admin feels sort of immediately at home for anyone who's spent any time on the internet. And so that uh, at our organization, the only time that we run into trouble with, you know, this is the admin, this is what it does, is someone who's just completely unfamiliar with computers or, or has a very limited experience with them. So anybody else, it's just, it's just like uh, riding a bike. When it, when it comes to the admin, I mean, the greatest thing that ever happened for users of the admin is like Hotmail. I tell people, if you've used a web-based email account, you can use the admin. You'll survive. It's just a couple of boxes, and you hit save, and you're done. Um, I, I have never, I haven't had a single problem with anybody who went, oh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, the web is so permutated uh, society now that just a simple form, you know, people run into them all the time, and that's pretty much what the admin is, is a simple form. Mm -hmm. And, and you actually, as far as how it could be improved, you actually find people asking for improvements similar to things they see on more advanced web applications. Like, the, like they'll say, gee, could I moderate all these comments in a batch, like from the, from the main uh, yeah. screen? <laughs> or, you know, it, um, or when you're dealing with the inline changes and all that, which I, I haven't had a chance to work with 1.0 much yet, but I'm told that there's improvements there. I think we have, you know, a CMS, and Jang the Django admin's um, a lot easier to use than um, our paper CMS, so um, 
people generally like it. Um, one of the things that I think that Django developers don't always do is even before New Forms Admin, there's a lot of customizations that you can do um, to make it easier for people to enter things, just grouping fields, help text, things like that. So. So Maura, before, before we got on stage, you were talking about how you did some training of the admin? Oh, no, I, have, I actually haven't done this yet, but um, my idea was to do a screencast and, or, or some training and just basically talk about the Django admin fields uh, apart from any particular app, just, you know, um, you, these are the different fields that you'll encounter, um, you know, a foreign key, you know, many to many. Um, if it's bold, then it means it's required. If it's not bold, it's not required, that kind of thing. Right, I'm wondering whether we should somehow package that up in a generic fashion, like the, here's this, like a, you know, walk through one page at a time, here is a required field, it's in bold, boom, and maybe it's like customized for your data. Right. Do yeah. you think that would be useful? I think that would overkill? be incredibly useful. I think that because I'm so familiar with the Django admin, I just, there's probably a lot of things that you kind of take for granted that you already know when you look at it that maybe someone new to it, it's not as obvious to them, and if you teach them, it's like, teaching them to fish kind of instead of, you know, giving them food. What are the, the top admin features that you'd like to see? Other than multiple deletion. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> That's perfect. All right. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> well, I, well I, I kind of bumbled on this in our earlier conversations, but I don't really know how to articulate it either. But I mean, one of the, the problems of dealing with data that is in some senses um, peculiar to journalism or is just very commonly found within journalism, if not unique to it, is that, the, that you're almost always um, uh, starting with um, some sort of third party data as like your beginning point. Like, like uh, you're starting with the school scores data that's released by the state of California. Um, and, 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 and so there's, there's, a, there's a series of like cleanup and, and, and migration and transformation stuff that you always, almost always have to do uh, to when you're dealing with government data just to do the analysis to write the story, let alone to build a new web application based on the data. And those things are just re uh, recur and happen in virtually every project. And now since Django is so easy, I actually spend much more time preparing the data than I actually do developing, uh, developing it for the website. Uh, and, uh, and, and those tasks are things I'm sure people are familiar with, which is, it's just very simple things often, standardization of mutations and, and parent-child relationships, where you, where you still want to maintain the initial relationship that was in the data as you got it from the source, but for the purposes of, say, a web application or analysis, you want to you wanna, you wanna co combine two nominative categories, say. Like where in the school's data, it, there's a city field in the address that the state provides and is commonly filled with misspellings and, and other problems that you don't necessarily want to eliminate because you need to maintain the integrity of the data should you ever need to, to go back to it. But you'd like to be able to easily, and to be able to do things like that in the admin where that could be deputized to someone else while the programmer gets to do the, the, the programming stuff rather than going through 60,000 uh, dog breed names like I had to do and, and get all the combinations of the things handwritten in the form by the guy who filled it out, you know, um, would be a huge boon. What's the data model like for the, the dog names thing? Um, it's actually very simple. The ultimate, what I did is I, uh, uh, since Los Angeles, um, every block having just launched in LA, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the problems of gathering public data in LA. And one of them is that the, uh, the bureaucratic topography, I guess that you would call it, is just very fragmented. It's like, so if you're doing every block San Francisco, um, I mean, there's essentially one city, city authority that maintains and centralizes all the stuff. It's um, you know, not unlike a, a small European country, say like Sweden or France or something, where you just go to the, to the government office for each thing and get it. But in Los Angeles, you have LA City, and you have LA County, and you have Santa Monica, and you have West Hollywood, and you have Pasadena, and you have Long Beach, and you have all these places, and they all have their own police departments, and they all have their own... Uh, like public health is something that was more centralized, I think you guys probably had an easier time with that for like restaurant inspection, but it varies from source to source. and so. Say for the dogs data, it was um, like when I first moved to LA, I knew I was going to have to learn all this, this fragmented uh, bureaucracy. So it was let's just start putting in public information requests and try to learn LA County. And I think that that set ended up being maybe 10 different public information requests that came back in, in different CSV files, which I then combined into one large table, which I did sort of the cleaning and the standardization process on, which then once that was complete, was migrated into a, a Django app um, afterward. But, if, but if, if, if all that stuff, the standardization that I ended up having to do through SQL and, and uh, could have been done within the admin, 
by someone else, it would have saved a ton of time and labor. That's a, that would be a cool feature. Like it's sort of along the same lines as multiple deletion. It's like multiple changing. Like if you have John and Johnny, and you want to combine those, like filter, show me all the John and Johnny, and just like okay, change them all definitively to John. Mm -hmm. Boom. That would be really really cool. Patches welcome. <laughs> uh, so Matt, wait, you've on Twitter and on your blog and in various places always made self-deprecating. I'm just a journalist, you know, I'm not a programmer, but Django helps me be productive. Why, why do you think Django lets you be productive? A um, couple of reasons. First of which being Python, being the first language that I actually started to learn and actually learned it. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a knuckle-dragging, mouth-breathing, land-grant graduate from the Midwest, you know, liberal arts major, woo, um, who, who, you know, the toughest class I took in college was like, you know, 18th century English literature. Uh, so I had no experience with programming. Got into database journalism, uh, like Ben was describing, and I realized, you know, maybe I ought to learn a scripting language. So. Uh, people around me that I respected were, were all talking about Perl. You could do all kinds of crazy stuff in Perl. And I'm like, okay, I'll give Perl a shot. And about three days later, I'm like, oh, hell with that. Um, so then a couple other guys I knew, they were like, yeah, we, we use PHP to do stuff. I'm like, okay, I'll try PHP. Again, three days later, oh, hell with that. Uh, I'll never get that. Um, Python was the first language I actually tried and was like, okay, I want to do this. And, and very early on, it was like, well, I don't know how to express that. Maybe it should be like this. Oh my God, it worked. Uh, it just, for some reason, kind of the, the Python syntax is kind of the way I thought it should be. And it just did. And, and you know, some, a lot of times it was just, you know, I was a little bit off and, and it was just a process of learning. But the learning curve for me on Python was a lot, lot less steep than it was for any of the half a dozen other things I've tried, um, which made, Django a lot easier for me uh, because you know I, I know SQL pretty well, so I could look at uh, view syntax and go, okay, I know what this is doing, uh, I, and and it just kind of was like uh, it just kind of went from there. The discussion earlier, the, somebody finally put a, a, a name to the uh, the way that I learned Django, which was the Z-shaped learning curve, where I ran right up against that wall and bounced off it hard kind of went backwards and then started going up again. And I've, I've described it to other people who are trying to learn Django. It's kind of a, a roller coaster of learning curves where you get going up, 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 and then you hit the top and you're like, holy crap, I can do something! And then you go back up again and uh, um, you just repeat over and over again until one day you wake up and you say, oh, well, I'm gonna implement this. And you implement it and it works just that fast, just like that. It works as you thought about it in your head and you realize, holy crap. The world has just opened up to me. And that was kind of the process of, of me learning Django, which is just, I think it should do this, and I think it should be this way, and oh my god, it worked that way. So, I don't know, dumb luck, I guess. I, I think it's really significant that we've got people on this panel that sort of come from both sides. We have journalists that happen to program because of Django, and we have programmers that happen to be into journalism and have learned a lot about journalism because of Django. And I think it's, um, I don't know what it is, but I think it's significant that sort of we've got Django in the middle bridging these two very, very different sides of, of, uh, of what's going on. Anything else on that topic? What do you guys absolutely hate about working with Django, or, or at least dislike? I hate the feeds framework. <laughs> the syndication feeds? Yes. Um, I, and we are using 096 at work, um, and we'll upgrade to 1.02, and I'm, I, I know there's been some improvements. I haven't used it very much, but um, I mean, have you ever thought of making it more like a generic view, or just, I don't know, more, it's kind of, I don't know. I, I hate in the URL conf you kind of like, you kind of be dicked. Be dicked. Oh, yeah. You don't have to call it that. You can call it flower. Well, dicked. that's true, but still, <laughs> nonetheless, it is still the feed dicked. Okay. Sure. Um, 
I would say one of the most exciting things that if I paid closer attention, I probably already would have known about, but that I saw here this weekend was the, the I believe it's called demigrations yesterday, the ability to change your model without uh, eliminating the data was just something that I constantly ran into. And if, 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 you're, if, you're work, if you're learning Django and even learning web development as you kind of do this as you go along, I mean, like I think both Matt and I come to Django with a very large data set that you want to like get online. You know what I mean? It's not like a green grass thing where you're going to be building it from scratch. And so if you're, as you're learning it, you're making mistakes and you're having to, 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 to mess around with your models and get things straight, having to always like rebuild the data set every time you made that change was something that was um, pretty burdensome. Uh, PolitiFact was my first project and I was kind of developing it with the uh, Washington Bureau Chief. And we were, we were doing a very iterative process, although we didn't know what that was at the time. We weren't smart enough to know what it was. So uh, he'd call me up and say, OK, hey, I want to capture this information. So I'd, I'd sketch out a model and, or a series of models and related tables. And I'd send him the, you know, go to the admin and, and try it out now. And he'd enter in, uh, actually, he'd report it out a, a fact check of something that I believe Mitt Romney had said. And uh, he'd go, OK, well, I really, would, I really think we ought to store this information. I think we ought to do it, or I think we ought to do this other thing. And I'm like, OK wipe it away, start all over again. And that was fine when it was just one, but then he got kind of excited and started doing four, five, six, and 10, and then asked me to change something else. And I'm like, uh, you, you know what's gonna happen, right? He's like, oh, <laughs> I'll do it anyway. And, and you know, we've, I've now reached the stage where uh, the editors would come to me and like, can we do this, that, or the other thing? I'm like, you realize we have like over seven, we have almost 700 statements in the database right now. I don't want to mess with it. I just don't. I'm too scared. I just leave it alone. It works. Don't jinx it, all right? So, yes, database migrations. Okay. We actually have um, a group of Rails developers at the Atlanta Jordan Constitution as well, and as you know, Rails has migrations. Um, and so, um, you know, I get to hear that all the time. Um, so we, we one, of, one of the things I'm actually really interested to look at that I haven't yet is um, uh, Simon's thing about migrations, because I think it's kind of grown similar to the way we do. We have kind of, st we do a lot of migrations and they're very, they're just very scary when you're doing it on a live production database. And so, um, you know, we kind of store them or for reference in a Railsian way. Like, I don't know if you're familiar, there's like 001 and 002 for your order. Um, and and then, and then we kind of run them and pray. <laughs> How many people here have written their own migration stuff for Django? <laughs> Impressive. Matt, what do you hate yeah, about Yeah, I, I hate to beat a dead horse, but yeah, migrations, migrations. suck and uh, we need to change them. What other than migrations? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think probably the, the biggest thing um, that sucks about working with Django is when you have to work outside of Django, that kind of makes everything else that much more sucky. Explain like, you know, that. Well, you know, so, so if you, you spend all day writing Django and then um, you have to work within, um, you know, maintain some old Perl code or maintain some, something that's not Django, it, it kind of outside spoils of Python, you. Then. It kind of spoils you for everything else you have to do. I got one. Uh, aggregate. Uh, uh, something that Ben and I have done a lot uh, with database journalism is aggregates. That's pretty much all that, all that you do is you're, you're, you're grouping and counting and summing and sorting and averaging and all that stuff. And that was a, that was a, uh, you know, a, a stopping point for me was I got, I got in there I'm like, okay, now I want to count all these things. And I'm like, where's, you know, where's sales.objects.count and, uh, or group by this thing, then count them. And mm -hmm. yes, you can drop into SQL and do it, but boy, do I wish that uh, there was that one line, group it by this field, count up the number of unique things within that. And mm -hmm. I'm definitely encouraged by the fact that a lot of these things that we're griping about are things that, you know, if they're not in progress, they're things that, that we're thinking about as a community. So that, that makes me happy. Right. One of the things, um, maybe some of you feel my pain, but um, we only work on releases at work, so we only work on Django 0.9.6, and now we're going to work on Django 1.0, and I understand why there wasn't a Django 0.9.7, but please do not wait so long for your next version of Django. Okay, so that was going to be my very next question. You mentioned you're on 0.9.6. Matt, you guys are on 0.9.1. Um, 
Yeah, so we're actually not on 091. We've, we've got our, our internal version of Ellington that, that um, isn't commercial that we just use internally. Um, it's on revision 1290 from November 2005. Um, but we do, we, we're uh, six failing tests away from being 100% on 1.0 and uh, launching stuff later this month internally and uh, should have commercial offerings by the end of the, ne the next month or so. Um, so yeah, that's been, um, you know, sort of a situation particular to us that, um, you know, I have shiny things in new versions of Django that I can't use yet or have to backport. That's something that we on the core developer team, you know, just like always run trunk on everything. I always run trunk on my little work stuff and projects. How much of a pain is it? I mean, you've already kind of talked about it. Maybe the other two guys talk about, is it really a huge pain to run on trunk uh, in terms of the pointy haired bosses requiring that you run on a release? Any experiences with that? Yeah, um, when we set up PolitiFact for the first time, they were scared to death of something that wasn't 1.0. And then I said, well, I'd like to run Trunk. And they went, oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. So PolitiFact runs on 9.6. Uh, since that actually succeeded and, and nobody died, um, <laughs> you know, uh, the Neighborhood Watch is actually running on the GeoDjango branch prior to, uh, to 1.0. And that was actually a, a the SVN version of that. So we've, we've kind of broken through some barriers here uh, at the times where they were extremely uncomfortable with things. And now it worked. So they're like, eh, as long as you've got a good reason to do it, we can do it. Let's give it a shot. So it's, it's, we've, we've, for whatever reason, become more agile when we, when we do that. And, and we're now moving. Every, we, because, because we have one app running 9.6, we have one app running uh, a brand, uh, branch, we have to have them on separate servers, and we want to put them all together, which 1.0 with, with the GeoDjango contrib app is a huge deal for us. So maybe that's one argument for fewer releases, is it encourages work environments to be more agile <laughs> and, and run Trunk. I, I got to say, the last uh, couple of weeks on Trunk have been kind of rough with a really big code base. And uh, you know, kind of, uh, you're just recovering from the last big backwards incompatible change when you know, new comments drops or um, you know, old forms goes away, and you realize there's a whole bunch of stuff that you're not actually using, but it's still in your code base. And uh, oh, yeah, you can't load modules anymore. So, but uh, yeah, overall, I think uh, Trunk has been pretty stable the last couple of weeks withstanding. I, uh, go ahead. I would say that between 096 and 1.0, to answer your original question, yes, it would have been kind of a painful to run on Trunk at work um, with you know multiple developers. Um, even just for me, and this was a little while ago, even just on my personal blog code, I didn't look at it for a while, and I pulled it up and was hacking on it, and all of a sudden, form for model was deprecated, you know? Um, that kind of stuff was happening all of the time recently. So, it, yeah, it would have been kind of painful. Okay. I, would, I would just say that we're running on 9.6, but um, uh, our, our, our little Django Republic is a guerrilla republic. I mean, um, in addition to being the only developer, I guess, and it being my education in web development, it's also been my education in server administration where we're working over at uh, Media Temple. And so um, we haven't had the same problems in that sense. Okay. Time for Q&A. Any? Yeah, Russ. Certainly do. Um, first one, sort of uh, partial comments. One, the aggregation's on its way. If you've got use cases of interesting type queries, I want so seriously to get this into 1.1. God bless you, the, sir. The patch, is most, <laughs> the patch is pretty much ready to go, minus a couple, a little bit of edits yeah. and whatnot. If you have interesting use cases of types of aggregate queries you want to do, um, please let us know so we can make sure that we're covering that sort of, those sort of problems with the syntax and there aren't any bugs in those sort of areas. Um, the other one, a quick comment, was uh, about uh, evolution. Again, there's a panel this afternoon. We're all going to be talking about it. I'm also a little bit amazed that uh, Simon, by, by sheer force of personality and uh, the people he knows, can release a product three days ago and still get more press than Django Evolution, which has been around for nine months. <laughs> um, <laughs> the question I wanted to ask was about um, sort of the Web 2.0 waves arms wildly and journalism and the attitude of the organisations you work with and the less enlightened who haven't quite drunk all the Kool-Aid yet in terms of mashups and pulling information together and whatnot. You're all with traditional media organisations doing traditional newspapers and that sort of thing. 
Um, and you are, have got journalists presumably not going out and individually interviewing uh, dog owners to find out what type of dog they've got, they're, interview they're scraping. There are still newspapers out there that are very much just printing and putting ink on paper. Uh, and you end up with things like the AP coming out and saying, no, you can't quote more than four words on your website without paying a licence fee. Um, what's, the, what's the best way to educate the, I mean, it's interesting to me because I work for a company that is doing this sort of mashup integration and passing lots of, uh, doing search, passing information, uh, passing links back to traditional media organisations who aren't necessarily down with what we're doing with their, with their, with their content. How do we, as a community and, and, and just as individuals, convince them that this is in their benefit and it's in their interest to be into this mass linking, mass, uh, you know, building value by putting the links between data? Uh, it, pure and simply, economic terms. Um, particularly here in the United States, newspapers are, are hurting bad. And if you can go into a newspaper manager and say, if you let us do this, you'll make money, done. You, you don't have to say anything else after that. Uh, I may be slightly oversimplifying it, but Ben and I would probably agree with this, not that much. Um, the newspaper business model online right now is selling advertisers the most possible eyeballs uh, in a given day. Uh, they're selling advertising per thousand page views. So if you can show them what, what you're doing is going to increase the number of page views, they're not going to care at all. It, it, just, it means money in their pocket and, and right now every newspaper company in America could use every dollar in their pocket they can get. So. That's the approach I would take. Crass, yes. Not very idealistic, obviously. But it will work. It will work very quickly. Um, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of particularly senior newspaper executives, that's what they'll understand. This whole idea of sharing information and uh, extracting more meaning out of, out of disparate data and uh, somehow coming to some greater understanding, uh, they're not, it goes right over their head. Say, you're going to make more money if you let us do this? Done. Okay. Any ideas on how to get their ears in the first place? <laughs> well, well, Adrian, you just had some success getting every block on the Chicago Tribune's website and the Chicago Sun-Times website, right? What was, how did that happen? So there, it's sort of a special case because I knew some people there and they were interested in the project. There was some knowledge of the fact that the project existed. Uh, in my own experience, um, it's frustrating and it's difficult. Uh, and I've just had some lucky chances to work in places where there's been some clued in people. Okay, you go first? You were first. All right. Uh, so just backing up what Adrian was saying earlier about uh, journalists being some of the most technologically backwards people you can possibly work with. I, I work at a school of journalism, and uh, you know, you want to you want to sell them on this Django thing, and they're going to come in and say they have to type in an href equals blah blah blah, and they're going to run screaming back to WordPress. So, implementing without tiny MCE is kind of not an option if you want to do these you know four hour projects, and you sort of got to you know go get the project and get it all installed. The way I'd love to see things work would be, you know, one line in a settings file would pull out a, a, a contrib thing and every text field would just have it. Um, but part two to that is not just kind of the tiny MCE that we see, but a toggleable field so you can toggle between visual and HTML for when it screws up and have it nice and clean. So, you know, look to recent versions of WordPress. They do that really cleanly. Yeah, I, I don't let people use HTML because um, they know a little bit of HTML would be just enough to be dangerous. Yeah, I, I think that the, the right place to put that would be in the new admin uh, classes. Uh, use MCE equals true or, you know, whatever, and it would automatically do it for every text field. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I mean, I've done tiny MC in Django. It's, it's pretty easy. And I, doesn't Tiny MC have a thing where it can toggle itself, like within the, its? The default version, if you switch out to HTML mode, it brings up a, a separate window, and you get this tangle of spaghetti code. And if you look at the equivalent thing in WordPress, you just get nice, clean text with just the minimal amount of formatting. Wish list. Cool. Yeah, over there. Uh, this isn't really a Django thing. It's more content type inside of a content management system inside of a 
traditional newspaper, something I've been obsessed with since, uh, since probably my second year of college. How do you take categories like front section, local, national sports, and then push that onto a better situation on the web? So you have items like stories, multimedia, video, and then you have categories, tagging, and everything like that. But how do you end up keeping everything flat enough so that way it makes sense to the traditional editors, but yet, but yet makes sense inside the database as well? I think the honest answer is no one's really figured that out yet. I mean, pull up, pull up any newspaper.com and, and ask yourself, did they really figure that one out? Uh, and I think the answer is no. Uh, so I heard somebody describe newspaper websites as being a giant ball of mud <laughs> that we're just packing on more stuff and it's just accumulating over time until it just grows and grows and grows. Uh, so maybe Matt has a better answer than I do, but from, from what I can see, no one's, no one's answered that question satisfactorily yet. And if they do, they're going to make a shitload of money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the technical side, um, categorize everything, tag everything, do it in a generic way, um, and then build some, just, you know, some utilities that help you pull stuff out. Um, I mean, we've, we've got, uh, you know, some stuff in Ellington that makes it easy to, you know, sort of bring up, uh, you know, show me all of the content for this section, show all, all of the content for this category. Um, and it's just, it's really only works that way because, you know, everything's categorized. And once you talk about, you know, user-generated tagging, everything's tagged, aggregate that stuff and uh, do, you know, do good visualizations on that. Go ahead. I just quickly want to say thanks to Ben and his team for the best internet black hole of the last two weeks in the dog project. <laughs> What's your dog's name? Scruffy. Scruffy. And, and how popular is Scruffy? I didn't put him in because you guys just included, included LA County dogs. Oh, okay. We're unfortunately just south of the border by you, like 300 yards. You're an OC? Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for using the site. I appreciate it. It was fabulous. It was fun. I have a real quick uh, thing to talk a, a little bit about the syndication framework. Um, it actually, if you if you dig into it just a little bit, you'll notice there's a views.py file, and it literally is just a generic view. So outside of any problem with regards to how you deal with the um, like data and making nicer feeds and whatever, uh, if if you're frustrated with how it forces you to deal with like where data is coming through. In my projects, personally, I've just ripped out that view and I wrap it in other views and, and just throw it around anywhere. Yeah, I guess my beef is really that the way, the default way that you're supposed to use it that's right. presented as a bit in Default ideal. way is just totally broken. <laughs> One more question. This isn't necessarily Django related, but I was wondering if the four people on the panel could talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of the newspaper's decline uh, like <laughs> that we're reading a lot about and how you guys see just technology and, I mean, you guys are kind of on the front lines of that, so what do you see it and how do you see it and I'd love to hear about that. I think In 15 words or less. In 15 words or less. I think uh, that Matt kind of um, really touched on what it's all about right now is page views equals dollars, which is unfortunate. Um, I think that has some negative effects on journalism because um, what people want to see or read is maybe not the most, you know, highbrow journalism. I mean, people love pictures of celebrities. We have lots of pictures of celebrities and they get lots of page views, which is dollars, but that, I don't really consider that journalism. Yeah. Uh, if you would have found us at the bar last night, Ben and I were. Uh... <laughs> drinking and talking about this in that particular order, um, I think what, what Ben and I want to believe and, and what I think some of the things that we're doing and, and the things that Adrian are doing is that we are hoping against hope that a new model, a new business model for journalism can arise from some of the things that we're, we're thinking about and doing and trying out and experimenting with that gets away from this, the more eyeballs wins idea that if you can sell an advertiser a specific piece of geography that they happen to that you know 80 90 percent of their customer base is in that should have value to them beyond just 
a thousand random page views that could come from anywhere in the world. So while as, as, as journalists, there's, there's this Chinese wall between the business side and the, and the journalism side. So I can't just walk into the advertising side and go, hey, let's, let's tell me how to make money and let's just start doing it. Um, but I can talk to my bosses and they can talk to their counterparts and we can, we can start trying to push these ideas. It's way too early to know if that's actually gonna succeed, uh, if the bottom won't fall out long before it does. Uh, but that's not to say that there aren't people trying to work on it, that there are good and useful and not involving Lindsay Lohan things that we can do to inform uh, our citizenry, uh, inform democracy, uh, not to get too high-headed here about it, but um, that, that should have value. And we need to build a business model around that. The problem is it's not there yet. It's not close. Yeah, I think uh, working with the within the existing page views equals dollars framework that um, you know while potentially broken is what we've got right now. Um, I think one thing you can really do is you know if you're doing those um, investigative journalism uh, data visualization projects, um, you know make it freaking compelling um, and make it really um, relevant to your audience. Um, I mean you can take something from a national data set and put a local spin on it, and uh, you know another thing you can do is you know get something that uh, is you know continually updated, um, something that people will come back to, um, and that'll, you know, that'll let you sustain the, the financial, um, you know, side of it. Um, and so hopefully, you know, do enough of those and, uh, you know, people stop asking you, um, you know, how your journalism is making money, is, is that a problem, so. One other thing uh, to that, that, that I learned, particularly with doing PolitiFact, uh, in kind of increasing the amount of traffic that you get to your site, is, uh, you know, PolitiFact is my first project. I never had to worry about you know, Google search engine optimization, but I learned and I put it in there and that's now paying off hugely in that uh, 80 plus percent of the traffic that we get comes in sideways. It doesn't come through the main page. Um, I learned how to make widgets, embeddable widgets uh, to, that other people can embed on their blogs and their sites and you can put our content any old place you want because the links come back to us. Uh, a Twitter feed, uh, what else have we done? Uh, Google uh, custom homepage gadgets. Uh, any, any, I just did an iPhone, uh, quick and dirty iPhone thing, because we found out that uh, PolitiFact gets like 40% of all of the mobile traffic that any of my newspaper company sites get, and 85% of that traffic is iPhones. So, hell with it, I'm making me an iPhone app. It took me a couple of hours. The, uh, by the way, if anybody's trying to do this, IUI, which is a JavaScript and CSS library, is awesome. <laughs> um, that's my short commercial because I used it. Um, <laughs> one of the interesting things about, um, I'm totally ripping this off from my boss, Chris Heisel, thank you, um, about um, online journalism versus print journalism is in print, when you bought the paper, you would get you know X number of stories. You might read some of them, you might not, but all the stories were subsidized by the fact that you bought the paper. It's like a package deal. It's like buying an album. Um, but now with online journalism, we can see what, reader, what the stories that readers are actually interested in, and so we can no longer subsidize all the stories in that way. It's like buying a single track off iTunes. And just to dovetail on that, I mean, if people in here are in the situation where they want to pitch something to news managers or to people in these in these organizations, I think one of the things he touched on will get you a lot of traction, which is that of search engine optimization, which is I think is something that Django can actually deliver on, and that will will provide great something greatly superior to virtually any newspaper CMS that's sort of on the market. Yeah. Like if you know, because if you if you just go to the LA Times site right now and click on maybe the main story and look what that URL looks like and then ask yourself how well that's going to do in a sure. search engine, you know, and compare that to what you, you can say to them and you can give them the buzzword and you can then actually, I think, deliver the results. And I think, I, from the people, the managers I work with, I think that's a pitch that will resonate and that will, um, will, will, will click. Designing your, designing your own URLs is Google search engine observation out of the box. Sem clean semantic URLs. Is, is one of the things you can do, and it's just, it's baked in. You just have to do it. Yeah, I like to say that Django is SEO friendly by default for free. Yeah. That, how much time do we have, by the way? About done? I have one quick question that that reminded me of. On our djangoproject.com homepage, we have, you know, the, the things that we advertise, quote unquote. We come with an admin framework, we come with internationalization, we come with a template language. 
it sounds as if you guys are saying we should advertise some slightly different things or additional things. Additional, yeah. Do you think that advertising the SEO, this is something I've never even thought of. Do you think that it's worth advertising that at that level? Or is there anything else that we should advertise at that level? It's kind of amazing to me that people make a bunch of money doing SEO consulting. Um, yeah. Not that people don't need it, but the fact of the matter is, is you just need a good URL and a good title tag, and Django encourages that. So, I mean, I think that, you know, like I said, I think Django is S encourages you to be SEO friendly. I think it's also ultimately dependent on the audience that you're aiming at. If if the Django project page is aimed at developers as, as a whole, uh, maybe, maybe not. If it's aimed at IT executives who are debating whether or not they want to buy in and, and, and deploy Django in their shop, yeah I, yeah, I definitely would put it on there. And, and if I was trying to sell Ellington, I definitely would mention that. I think we got one. Okay. One more. I'm wondering whether anyone thinks that newspapers really care about the like dead tree archives that they've got the last 150 years. Because I've written a, a, a um, you know newspaper viewer that just you stick in microfilm images, and out comes sort of a dirty OCR newspaper site. But all the stuff that I've seen is just like oh you can pay for access and you know you no, nobody looks at that because they don't know what's in there in the first place. Well, you know, you'd be surprised. Um, at the AJC, we have that. You can pay for old new access to the old archives. And the only reason it's still pay is because people pay for it. So it does happen. I was say, they care deeply about their archives because they try to make money off of them. Unfortunately, uh, well, I, fortunately, uh, the company I work for, actually, the archives are open going back to the 80s. The unfortunate side of that is that it's in the world's most hideous uh, search interface that makes it impossibly ugly to deal with. Um, newspaper archives are actually big money. Uh, newspapers sell their content to like LexisNexis to make a, to a commercial aggregation company that other researchers use around the company or country. So, um, would I love to see us doing a, a hell of a lot more with our archives? Absolutely, because if you think about it, your local newspaper is the best, most consistent archive of the history of your community going. No matter what you think of your hometown newspaper, there's nothing better when looking at the history of your community than your newspaper, good or bad as it may be. Um, so I think there's incredible value, uh, in, uh, incredible long tail value uh, in the archives going way, way back. The problem is that a lot of newspapers are, are just trying to stay above water right now and keep up with things going on the web. They're not looking backwards at the stuff they've, they've got. We're, we're too busy going forward to know where, we're, where we've been. Uh, one thing I'll note, um, we don't have um, our, all of our print archives going back, uh, you know, till the dawn of time, um, though we probably should. Um, we notice that um, we get a lot of um, search traffic and a lot of eyeballs because our archives are open. Um, and so from a, from a sort of a business standpoint, um, I think we make more, uh, more money on advertisement because we have, you know, you can go back to the early 90s and everything we've published online is there and it's not behind a registration wall or a paywall, it's just there, take it. Um, and I think we get more page views coming in via Google because of that. Sure, and I think there's also a search for monetization out of those as well. I mean, the New York Times has been a leader in doing this where they've put up a, a large portion of their archives and some, even the front pages and things like that. And um, I, I, I think it's just a matter of the technology being in place for a service like ProQuest, if you've ever seen ProQuest, where you can go and um, I think on our site you can find an article in the archives um, and then purchase it, but you never actually get to see a preview of it. So like you're paying five bucks without even seeing what the page looks like. And um, I, think that, I think that the modernization of that technology where you could maybe have just the, the printed text in you know, uh, HTML of, say, an old story, but maybe you, th you throw down five bucks to get an image file of what that page looked like or that editorial cartoon that ran that day or of that obituary for your grandfather or any of that stuff, I think that there probably is a good deal of long tail potential for that. It's just, or old photos even, you know, it's just a matter of, of, it, of getting it out online. But I think that, especially the New York Times leadership, and I think the general sort of maximum page view sort of worldview has led people to see that there's at least some value in people coming in through search. And I hope that it starts that way and leads to something more. Okay. Thanks, guys. Give it up for the panelists. Yep.